podcast all the time is I know I have the tools to be successful. I'm just not accessing it. So what gave you that in- invitation to access it? Was I, mean, it- I, think it's, I think it's here, but I also think it's here. You know, like yeah. if it's not here, then there's no way it's here. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, because like if it's not in your heart, then you're not going to get out of bed every single day on those hard days, on those days where you don't want to do it. Right? Because we all have that. There's no secret to that. Mm-hmm. You, if you tell me every day you wake up and you're like, yeah, I feel like a million bucks. No, like you're yeah. going to go through ups, downs, this, that, and the other throughout those days. And some of us have pulls and some of us have pulls and some of us don't. But on those days, you have to find a way to break through. So for me, that was the biggest possible thing. Finding a way to break through on those days where you don't want to break through. See, that's so critical though. Because so many people see those bad days as a reflection or judgment of themselves versus this is the challenge day. Like you didn't look for your A plus day, right? Tell me about, I think the reason I wanted to have you on was twofold. One is, you know, we talk a lot about strategy. We talk a lot about swing. We talk about a lot of things in sports, but club fitting is so critical because if you don't do it right, you know, people find themselves in trouble. And I, you know, a lot of my buddies that I play with are like, you know, they're changing heads and all this and they're not getting fit. Why is it so important for the best players in the world to be fit properly? Well, it's, it's, it's important for everybody. I mean, and, and granted, there is a, and I have to say this out loud, because getting fit in today's game, it's, it's expensive. It's a cost, right? It's, yeah. it's, uh, it would be considered still, also, although essential, it's still a luxury item. You know, if you're going to go up, but if you're going to go up and buy a brand new set of sticks, and you are, if you take your game seriously, meaning you want to get better, and you're going to invest your time in your game, and you're going to go out and buy new golf clubs and get them fit, because... It's, it's only to your benefit to have tools that are made for you. Um... Hey, welcome back to Mental Game Live. Here we are in episode 19. 19 in the uh, LSU baseball world is the great Ben McDonald. So uh, one of our beautifully recorded and up on the, the stadium all forever. Um, but uh, glad to be back. And this week we get a lot of really cool things started in Middle Game Live. I'm leaving tomorrow to go to FedEx to the St. Jude Classic, which is the first round of the PGA Tour playoffs. And uh, Bash, welcome in. What's going on? Oh man, it is a great night to be here. To be, I hear some you. activity in the background over there. Oh, do we? Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> no, like it's uh, maybe letting you know that there's a little. Uh, oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, from, from the that. yeah from the home studio, you get all sorts of it makes it great. I think it's awesome. Yeah, we're going through a little stranger danger right now. <laughs> What's up, Brandon? On the uh, on YouTube, if you're watching me on YouTube Live, make sure you hit me up on on. Uh, if you're hitting me up on Instagram Live, make sure you hit me up over here on YouTube. We got some cool stuff going on. Hey, anything that you've noticed? What about the fight in the uh, baseball this week, huh? You see it? Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Pretty All right, awesome. So, that's a way to get that's a way to get viewers, huh? Huh? A little bit. Just throw a start, drop the glove, and literally drop the glove, and just literally start. drop the glove. You ever get in a yeah, brawl? This... Do you ever get in a baseball fight? No, I've gotten a couple of bench clearing stuff, but no, just like a little dancing. No, yeah, just didn't. no. That was uh, awesome. I mean, like I mean, when you start throw the glove down just, and then throw both fists up. That's when you throw both fists up and then you catch one to the to the left jaw and you are yeah KO'd on the field. I mean, yeah, that kind of sucks because uh, the guy got him on like on the way down. I don't even think he like like. But if you're gonna be know. if you're gonna be throwing haymakers, you better be willing to accept them. Oh, 100%. Like. Okay. So so here's my question about that, right? And the whole thing, um, the whole thing that's important it, to me was, I, I can't remember, who's the guy for the Indians? Um, oh, God. I just, is it like Iglesias or something like that? Yeah, something. He was upset the way that Tim Anderson has been respecting the game. This yeah. is built up. So there's a lot of animosity there. I love, listen, I know you're going to say, I can't believe you're going to say this and whatever. I love when the heated emotions get up like that. And you're talking about two conference rivals, two divisional rivals, Cleveland and Chicago. I think Chicago's in the tank right now. But if you're going to go, 
as a team and in the locker room, sometimes that's a great way to uh, galvanize a team and bring it together. And I know the reason I'm bringing that up is our guest tonight is going to talk about that in just a minute because I know what it takes to build. So let's, before we bring up Jake, anything else that you've noticed this week in base in sports, baseball, anything that's caught your attention? No, I think we're uh, just in the middle of this baseball uh, kind of lull right here, right before football starts. And, you know, probably like one of the, the – oh, I'm going to be real. I'm a, I'm a more of a uh, football guy than I am. Baseball. Baseball guy because uh, – So, so here's just, the question I have. I just love it. Yeah, so here's, love the, it. here's the question I have for you. Are you Tennessee or Ole Miss? Because you grew up in Knoxville. Yeah. You went to, you went to Ole Miss. So I will put it to you like this, and no way am I comparing myself to Peyton Manning, but I kind of take the side of uh, what Peyton Manning did. His family was like Ole Miss people. He went to Tennessee, and he's like, man, I, I respect Ole Miss. That's where my family went, but like I'm a Tennessee guy. So I'll go to the flip side and be like, I respect Tennessee because that's where my family has allegiances to, but I mean, I went to Ole Miss, so – so you're going to break out the baby blues over the orange. Right there. Yep, I get it. Yeah, or I don't know if it's orange. It's more of a bright yellow. I don't know if you have that. Um, it's not – let's just uh, – it's not orange. <laughs> not orange. Yeah, right. It hurts my eyes. It hurts your eyes. I get it. Yeah. So let, let's let's bring in our guest tonight, Jake Gannis. Jake is uh, – the reason I wanted to bring him in right now is there's a couple facets, right? He's the head coach of Moody High School in outside of Birmingham, Alabama, Moody, Alabama. And you may say, I mean, why are we bring in a high school coach? Well, I'm going to tell you because this guy is a leader of men. He's played in the SEC. He's played in the NFL. He knows what it's like. You bring up Jake. Let's get him going. Jake, welcome to Mental Game Live. Thanks for being here. Yep. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm excited. All right. So since we're talking about fighting, there was a very big fight today at the LSU football practice. And uh, with their two, the star wide receiver and the star rush end, yep. fights in football during summer training, common, very common. Um, probably more common at LSU and the bigger yeah. schools. I'll never forget my first brawl that I was involved in at Georgia. Um, I mean, it was like an O lineman and a DN going at it, and then before you knew it, it was like 40 on 40, and I was just in the middle. And I like partnered up with this O line, I was like, Hey, man, come here. And we just like act like we we're pushing each other, you know. I didn't know what was going on. I mean, but yeah, it's real common, especially I think the older you get, the more common it gets, honestly, because you're it becomes more of a job every level, um, every year as you get closer to NFL or even when you're in the NFL. I think that's why when they do OTAs or the practices, joint practices, there's a brawl every single time because I mean, you're competing for food on your kid's table. I mean, it is absolutely cutthroat at the next level in terms of keeping your roster spot. And then now with college and the portal, hell, coaches can cut you now. I mean, they can tell you in a roundabout way, go get in the portal. Um, your scholarship's no good, you know, and now scholarships are yearly, which I don't think a lot of people know. You know, when I signed in 2012, it was a four-year deal. Um, I had – Four years of eligibility, and I, you know, you get a fifth if you redshirt or whatever. And now it's so different; it's a year-to-year -year thing. And so, yeah, I mean, tempers flare. And as a coach, you want it, and then you don't because you don't want it to create division. But at the same time, you want to know that your kids have, you know, a little something in their neck, and they, ain't, you know, we're not scared. And don't really matter who I'm going against. When those kind of happen, like take us through what it would take, like at a, like at LSU right now, your two big stars. And they're a team that had a good first year under Brian Kelly. He's trying to establish some culture, yep. right? And it's one of the reasons we're bringing you in. So probably a little bit of that, he's got a little smile on his face, probably to the media. He's like, oh, it's a terrible idea. Probably when that coach in the room shuts in, he's like, that's what I wanted to see, right? There were no broken bones. There's no fights in the locker room. Is that how you would handle it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you. I think you can divide teams up like – I compare it like wolves. Like you, you have alphas, and I think the best team not, doesn't necessarily have the most alphas, but they have alphas that respect each other. And so, when your offensive alpha and your defensive alpha meet, hell, they're gonna fight. And um, 
I think everybody on the defense is going to rally behind the defense player and everybody on the offense is going to rally behind them. And it's only going to elevate everybody else's game. And, uh, and you know, practice, it gets so monotonous, especially in college, this fall camp, like those schedules. I don't know if y'all seen them. It's like – tell, 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 our, tell our listeners kind of what a fall camp looks like. Oh, man. So, you know, when I – I don't know how many schools are doing it now. I think a good bit probably. But we went in a hotel, uh, even at UAB and uh, Georgia. And, I mean, you got 6 a.m. wake up, 6.45 breakfast, 7.30 tape treatment, 8 o'clock position meetings, you know, 9 o'clock practice, 11 o'clock you're done, shower, you know, lunch, maybe an hour or two downtime, then you're back up there for meetings, special teams walk through, meetings, lift, dinner, meetings, lights out by 10, 10 30 and it's every day, you know, there is no weekends. Um, and it's like, depending on when school starts, you're you begging know, for school to start, aren't you? Oh my God. So when school starts, <laughs> you have to get out of it. But like, I remember one year, yeah, I think it was my second year and we were, we were bad, but man, like camp was like four weeks. And, you know, I, I debated a lot of things during that time, you know, like, is this for me? You know, I might can just go ahead and, hang this up, but, you know, I'm obviously glad we stuck through it. But, man, um, it's tough, and it tests you um, for sure. So when you see it, when you're building a culture of a team like that and they're scrapping, when those players go in the locker room, though, it's over, right? I mean, it's not going to carry. That's going to be policed a little bit and managed by the the leaders of the team, correct? Correct. And I think that's the hard part um, of a coach's job is knowing, like, when did it get personal and like why, especially if it's the same two kids, same kind of group. Um, and that's something that is tough, especially for me. So when we came in here, I was hell bent on making a culture of like not being scared of anybody. You know, Moody was very just average, just like when you would talk about Moody football or at the, you know, not necessarily all athletics, but Moody football is just like a four and six, five and five team classic. Good team, you know, don't win the big game kind of thing. I bet, so, I bet people would sit around the breakfast place and say we could have won that game. That game it. was close. Man, we <laughs> held the net, the state champion. We held them to yeah, within a touchdown right. going into the fourth quarter, right? They had all the stories. That's right. Moral so victories. victories. Moral, moral victories. And so that was one of my things last year was no more victories. Um, you know, we went – did a seven-on-seven seven at Auburn last year, and we won it. Um, beat some really big teams. Um Seven A teams from Georgia, seven A from Alabama, and that was one of those things. We went in there, we went down there to compete, and that was the first time my kids have won anything. And so, anyways, back to the spring practice. I think we had three or four fights a day, and I'm loving it, and I'm eating it up, and I'm like, yes, like we need an edge, like we can't play scared. We gotta, we're trying to develop a culture like of belief where no matter who we're playing, we can win. Because I believe that I've, I've never played in a game or coaching game. I think we can win. But on the flip side, I didn't do a good enough job year one of maintaining those locker room relationships like you just mentioned. I kind of let some things fester and and create small pockets on my team. And it's something that it was huge learning experience for me. But uh, we've learned and, gr- and grown from it. But it cost us because we were undisciplined late in games, big games. Because that's who we are. We that's who we were. Our character and our culture was like we're big bad bullies, but we can't control our temper. You know, we we had personal fouls, you know, stupid stuff that I felt like as a player, I didn't really have an issue. You know, there's pictures on the internet of me in people's faces. You know, I was, you know, a trash talker and I was very intense, but I I knew where the line was, and I think that I took my kids past that line, and uh, I don't think I can get some of them back. So um, that was a huge learning thing for me. Uh, I think I said, whoa, not go about a million times last year because I wanted to have to pull my guys back and not push. I want to say, whoa, 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 not go, go, go. So this year it's been kind of different. I've been more, you know, go because I've been hammering, hey, be a good teammate, be a good teammate, take care of your brother. And we haven't necessarily had as many – fights and as many ordeals but I think at the same time our team chemistry is a lot better so it's give and take and uh it's tough establishing that line that's so critical right yes 
I remember having a conversation with Landon Dickerson at Alabama one day in the locker room. And Landon Dickerson, a center, and he was he's in the NFL with the Philadelphia Eagles, and he had this amazing ability to induce personal fouls and unsportsmanlike on the opposing team. And yeah. it was crazy because he could get them like thrown out of games. Yeah. And we were talking to him his very first game. Like he gets up in some guy's face, the guy shoves him back, tosses, throws a punch, he's out. Right. And we were talking about Landon, and we're sitting there, and he goes, I've never had an unsportsmanlike call. Like oh, he never. was he was so smart. And literally, Landon was very smart. He would get right to the line, but then get somebody to lose their cool. Like it was. And I think that's the thing we talk about with emotion, right? Is what we're talking yeah. about with fighting is that you're pushing players to the limit. You're asking them to stretch beyond, and that emotion overflows sometimes. But in any sport, whether it's golf, tennis, baseball, football, soccer, it doesn't matter. You got to know what where your line is mm-hmm. and know how to self-regulate a little bit. That's it. And so we we've been talking about it as a team this year. You know, kind of came up with something. It's like two words that don't go together, but like being a controlled savage. You know, absolutely playing <laughs> relentless. Like nobody wants to be out there with you because you're so crazy. But when your coach says, "Hey, come here," it's over. Like it's done because that's where I didn't have enough control over certain things last year. Where it was like, if I feel like I can't calm you down, we've gone too far. You know, if I can't walk you off and say, "Hey, man, like it's okay. We're we're gonna be okay." He's He's competing this and that, you know, and I think that's something as a young coach, especially coming in here, just trying to establish a winning culture, just trying to get my kids to believe they're good and that they can beat anybody. Um, I think that's what, you know, that's the hard thing is where's the line? How do you draw it? And I think being a controlled savage is kind of where we're headed and where I want us to be. What do, what do kids today need as a coach? When you're, you're 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 impacting young men on the football side, and you know we've got a bunch of kids watch mental game live and they watch our replays because it's a way for them to understand the mental game. If you could talk to those kids mm-hmm. and say, "Look, you're going to be coached in your life. Here's what you need, and here's who's going to deliver it." What do you see that they need in their life right now? Oh man, the accountability. You know, I think I mean, I've struggled with it as a player and as a human, but like being able to admit when you're wrong and, and saying that's on me coach, I'm sorry. It won't happen again. Like those simple words. If, if everybody had that mindset, when you make a mistake, instead of, I feel like kids now we're, we're looking for excuses. We're looking for any way to shut blame except just taking it. And um, I mean, it was, a specific moment in my life in in my sophomore year at UAB that changed how I viewed accountability. Um, And for me, you know, it's always easier just to admit that you messed up, you're wrong, you you know, whatever, as a coach, player, uh, educator, whatever it may be, and just – and then try to correct it and fix it instead of digging a hole and coming up with this excuse and this reason why, because I think our kids – are really good at coming up with every reason why it's not their fault. And I think it's really not their fault. It's how they're, it's how us adults are raising them right now. Like, I don't think people always say, you know, our generation, mine, uh, especially millennials, like we were raised by the, the greatest generation, you know? So I, I, I don't know, you know, that's just how we were raised. So if we're what's wrong, then now we're raising a different kind of generation, but I think that that discipline is really important. A lot of our kids don't have male figures in their life. So we are it. We are the only males that they listen to. And I think that's another, you know, problem in certain households is, you know, a lot of kids don't like getting yelled at by men because they don't get yelled at by men at home. And that's, and that's tough. And that's something that you have to work with. You got to know every single kid on your team situation because you can't yell at the, kid with a nuclear household the same as you yell at this kid who's been in five different houses with aunt grandma it's completely different and they're going to handle that situation different so i think getting to know these kids and like digging deep um it's head coach and then my position coach's job to kind of relay that information because we 
we can't just grill this kid when when hell he's not eating when he goes home. I mean, yeah. he needs no food in the fridge. So that's going to change the way I view him and I look at that rep where he loafed. Well, hey, he might not have any energy. <laughs> so right. it just changes things. And and, uh, and, and, and when a coach is yelling at him, it may be the first person that's verbalized any kind of feedback to him. Yeah. And while they may not see that as, as support, they may see that as getting put okay. down. Bash and I were raised in baseball programs where we learned that the national pastime is what, Bash? T.O.B. No T.O.B. No T.O.B. No transferal of blame. So you got to share your story about what happened your sophomore year. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'd love Let's to. Hear it. I, I didn't know if we were going to get there. Uh, Let's go. Come on. <laughs> oh, man, this is so You're bad. You're not going to tease us and then not go. Uh, there. This is, it's, it's, it's bad. But Okay. We're playing um, Middle Tennessee in 2013 at Legion Field from about 8,000 fans. Um, we uh, – we're it winning. It's a much nicer stadium at UAB now. That's right. Protect the is It is nice. So we're playing Middle Tennessee. It's the very end of the game. Um, they've got the ball, no timeouts, and they've probably got enough time for two or three plays. They're on – right, you can say the 50. All right, they, they throw a shot. Or, no, they run the ball. Excuse me. They run the ball, which we're in prevent. So they go all the way to about the five. We're running down – and there's about no, you know, no time left, but the clock stops on the first down. And two of my guys are running down the field, and it's about to be a penalty. Well, my gut reaction, because, like, we're – our D-linemen are way offsides. It's just to call a timeout. We had a timeout. At least we can get lined up, they get lined up, and we can still have a chance. Because I didn't know – I just – it's just a gut reaction thing. So, I call a timeout. Go to the sideline, head coach – is losing his mind on who called the timeout. He's yelling at the white hat. He's yelling at the defense. He said, who did they call? They said, number four called it. Coach McGee looks at me and says, Jake, did you call the timeout? I said, no, I didn't call a timeout. And he's like, you sure? And I said, yes, sir. White hat comes over and said, you didn't call a timeout? I said, no, I didn't call a timeout. And, like, it is so intense. It's, like, six seconds left, conference game. It's so bad. Well, Goes to the post game interview. We lose. They score. Um, goes to the post game interview, and all he did was kind of rip the rest of his timeout, this phantom timeout that didn't happen. And so I see that Saturday night. I'm sick to my stomach. I'm like, man, what should I do? You know, I don't say anything. So Sunday we come in for a team meeting. Comes in, he walks in, cuts the TV copy on. There's a cameraman, eye level in the end zone. Right at the last play, you see number four for UAB. Ah. Run around and do and do this. Ah. Yeah, about, cut like, it, this. cut it, cut the tape. This close, and he cuts it. And he and I was a team captain as a sophomore. I was, I think I'm, I was one of the only ones to ever be voted team captain as a sophomore at UAB. Calls me up from 119 teammates, and just embarrasses me to. Worst I've ever been embarrassed in my entire life. So from that point on, if I would have went to that sideline, said, Coach, I called the timeout, you know, he would probably have yelled, maybe taking me out the last play. I don't know. But it wouldn't have been this whole ordeal where I potentially lost some of my teammates' respect. I lost some coaches' respect. And that's where it flipped for me. And, I, you know, sometimes it takes that moment in your career or in your life to change or to – see things different. So for me, that was it. And for these kids, they might not have had it yet. They're still coasting and getting by. And uh, that's why as coaches, we got to hold them accountable. You know, it's real quick. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Why didn't they, I'm just curious now, why didn't they want you to call timeout? Uh, see, and that's, so that's my re, <laughs> you know, my reason. I appreciate you, man. So I, I was you know, asking, I was like, like hey, dude, but it's yeah, a, it was, a heady I'm play, thinking, man. I thought I was missing a stupid answer. So I wasn't going to ask it. No, I'm I mean, thinking. I'm, no, I just, I just remember thinking, like, man, this is going to be a false. This is going to be an offside. So it's going to be a free, offside. Free, yeah, it's going to be a free play. So I figured they're going to throw it up. It was like a fade. So I called the timeout because I just wanted to give him a defense that at least we had a chance on that. Yeah, at least know, it was, get lined up. Yeah. Yep. And so they ended up running like a sprint out, kind of typical goal line play and scoring and winning. And, uh, and that's all coach, you know, that's all he talked about was that timeout. And so I should have just, yeah, coach, I called it. I, I was a team captain. I had that authority on the team and with the staff, especially. I was, sure. 
shouldn't have been so scared. But again, I was young, uh, 19 years old, and I learned that lesson right there. And so that's something that, you know, I haven't told that story publicly, but I'm glad I did because I tell that story to my kids that have trouble with accountability. I call them in here and I tell them each that story. And, um, and I said, look, man, on your side, man, that's a good time out. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate yeah, I thought it. it was, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, what do you, I, 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 yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry. Sorry. No, 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 go ahead, I, go ahead. no, I was just going to say, I, I'm fascinated too. You're captain at, you, you were a captain at Georgia when you transferred, right? No was. Uh, that's really cool that you transferred in from a, from a group of five school and go immediately to Georgia where you become a major contributor, but also a team captain voted on by the teammates. I'm assuming. Yes. That's, I mean, that's, that's fascinating to me because talk about like that process and yeah. what you had to do, I guess, to earn that, yeah. that C, because I think that's like, that's probably the, the one of the coolest things that yeah. kind of, as I was researching, like, more no, about your story, like what I found out. That's definitely my number one accolade, um, you know, because I got there in January and we voted on those at the end of uh, November, you know, after the Georgia Tech game. And, uh, man, it was it was tough. So I go and, you know, I was really brought in for depth. They had lost um, three seniors in the inside linebacker room the year before. Um, they signed three freshman plus me so it's four new guys and then there's about five guys so about nine of us in that room for the two spots and um you know and I truly adopted the the process the, the Nick Saban process of like how do I get better today like I can't worry about you know playing Alabama at home which was a dream to get to play them you know they absolutely killed us in the rain but you know, I couldn't worry about that in January, February, March. I had to just kind of focus on what can I do today. So I tried to make it a point to do something extra every day. And so I was the last one, you know, at the Butts uh, facility. I was always watching film with the GAs or analysts or whoever would watch film with me. I was constantly doing extra work in the weight room. The weight strength coaches became my best friends. And, you know, I was just – I think I earned it first through action – and then I got my voice back because I was a vocal leader and I am a vocal leader, but I didn't go in and just start barking orders at these five stars, four stars that have been around each other for three, four years. You know, I was, I was treated like a freshman. It was so funny because I had to go to orientation and I'm, you know, I'm about done with school completely. I have 120 hours <laughs> and I'm in here with these freshmen early enrollees, like looking at, I'm like the grandpa, you know, like it, and so I just kind of had to start, you know, from the bottom, literally, and work my way up. And uh, it was really fun. And I, I could I could feel certain teammates, you know, like, you know, respect as we went along. You know, maybe one guy, he saw me run the extra sprint for the O-lineman that couldn't finish. Maybe this guy saw me up at the facility at midnight watching film, you know, Whatever it was, I think I slowly kind of earned it through my work. And uh, and then I got my voice and I was ended up, you know, kind of leading the defense. And we were we were good defense that year. We were top ten defense. And, you know, I was proud of what we accomplished. But uh yeah, it was a crazy, you know, year for me, but I was super uh, blessed to have been there. It had to be weird. I mean, we're talking about building culture and you you left a program that got shut down mm -hmm. to go to a program of a coach that was on the hot seat. Maybe didn't realize he was on the hot seat, but then all of a sudden it got hot real fast. Yeah. What was that like? Because, I mean, Bash and I both played for coaches that never were really at risk of losing their jobs. I mean, right. and, oh. and I never had a change of my coach, even my position coach in five years. Right. So that's what I tell I tell people, you know, I was so bad. They shut down a program <laughs> and fired a <laughs> tenured head coach. Um, I'm the common denominator. <laughs> so – um, you know, I get there and I knew that, you know, like, Hey, got to win the big one. That's, that was the thing. Got to win the big one. And, uh, and we didn't, you know, we, we were close, not with Alabama, but with Tennessee, even Florida early in that game and finished, you know, 10 and three, but there was a lot of turmoil that year, you know, that people don't really know about in terms of the staff. Um, you know, as players, we don't, we're not in staff meetings. We're not in the coach's locker room, but we hear, 
murmurs. We hear this, and I think that there was a divide, you know, in the coaching staff with certain coaches kind of gravitated toward this and this. And, you know, like me and you talked about with we tried to be like Alabama and we weren't Alabama um, in terms of like our strength um, program and stuff like that. And and it just kind of felt like it was the new guys, new recruits kind of versus the older guys that have been there and new coaches, older coaches. And so as players, we had a lot on us. You know, I remember the Kentucky week, you know, there was rumors um, about a fight between coaches, um, which we never heard about. And that was never addressed. We didn't, I still don't think it was true. I hope not, but still, like I remember seeing, you know, UGA rivals tweeting, there's police at Buttsmere facility arrested. You know, we're like, talking in our group me like hey what's going on who's at butts and uh so like we dealt with weird stuff like that all year um and then even in the bowl game we only had three full-time coaches I wow think, i think we had six that left and took other jobs like before the bowl game so it was like three full-time coaches and gas and we went and beat penn state with saquon barkley and mick sorley and uh so i think that shows you know kind of like our togetherness cohesiveness like our our and then like we had good leaders you know we had guys that controlled the locker room didn't let the outside circumstances kind of define us well we, we talk about that a lot because kids today have so many distractions right you, you kind of alluded to it you've got you've got rival sites you've got social media you've got fans that can get access so fast how how do you coach distractions for your kids because kids today listen our kids and and They've got a lot of things on their plates. They got, you know, they've got a lot of pressure to perform. They got families. They've got real life issues. They're growing up in front of us, and they're making sometimes grown up decisions with adolescent brains. What are the things that you see to help them, and how do you help them manage those distractions? Yeah, so it's tough because of cell phones and social media. Um, I mean, it's made it nearly impossible. You know, like if I wanted to truly eliminate distractions, I would take their phones every day, um, which we're not going to do because honestly, it's probably going to have a reverse effect. It's going to make them in a bad mood and not work hard because that's what they're so used to and so tied into. But, you know, well, when you come in our field house, you know, I saw that you got to check your bags, man. Like don't bring the little things that you can't control in here. You know, when you come to – the field house, this is your safe place. This is your, this is where you should be happy. This is where you get to play football. This is where you get to work out and hit somebody legally. You know, and it's like, you know, like I feel like a lot of kids now, instead of like using this like as an outlet, I think it is an outlet. I think it's a time for you to, you're dealing with stuff at home. You got girlfriend, you got teacher don't like me. You know, I got all this homework. Well, man, come to football and lay somebody out. Like, Take all that aggression, put it to good use on this football field. And so we talk about that as a team. You know, man, leave your bags at the door. Like, don't don't bring that in here and let it affect your day. I mean, this is this is a unique opportunity. You're only in high school once. You know, you can technically play college football as old as you are, as long as your clock don't start. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I remember seeing that kicker. The old, the old guy kicker at like South Carolina State um, a few years ago. Oh, yeah. um, so that opportunity may be there down the road, but like this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So you got to just leave it all at the door and enjoy this moment with your friends because you're never going to get it back. You're not going to see half these kids again for the rest of your life. And it's special. And that's why I'm a high school coach because I feel like it's the purest form of football. And is, I, is that, so, so is that high school? I mean, you know, now in high school, new coaches are coming in and they're recruiting players away. Are we losing the innocence of high school sports? You know, I think everything has a trickle down effect from the highest level, which is the NFL. Um, I think now with parents, you know, they're they're more willing to move to put their kid in a better situation. A lot of times it might not be for the right situation. It might be because somebody might have their ear or might, you know, be shady with this or that, but there is a lot of legitimate mood. I'm one of them. I moved from Atlanta to Birmingham. Um, and a lot of people don't know where I went to high school for nine months, my freshman year. 
But my parents moved from Vestavia Hills to Chelsea during the recession after just moving from Atlanta in 2009. So they moved twice in nine months to give me an opportunity, a better opportunity for me to play. They had me at guard. They had you at guard. had me at guard. And um, I said, no, y'all are getting me to tell all my stories that I don't tell. But uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm a, a you know, pretty good athlete. Um Maybe not the best, but – and I wasn't very big. I was tall, but I was skinny. So, anyways, I played guard. So, my parents, we lost – I know they lost money, and I haven't, you know, paid them back. You know, mom, dad, I love you. Thank you. Um, but I I moved twice for better opportunity. And so, I think that now with social media, with, you know, the different avenues that people have in high school sports with, you know – getting recruited earlier in terms of college recruiting, you know, like I think it's crazy that, that it's allowed, but you know, if you got this 2027 kid getting an offer, but you have a really good 2027 kid, well, you're going to try to go and get him an offer. Even if it's going to piss off every kid that's in the class above them. And so it's like, it's, it's push and pull. And there's a lot of coaches that like deter recruiting for younger kids. Um, for the culture of their team, which is their, it's their team. And there's some coaches that, you know, advocate for their younger players. And then it, it's really hard to manage those emotions because you've got juniors and seniors that coach, why am I not getting offers? But when you offer a younger kid, you're offering their ceiling. You're not offering them for what they are right now. You're offering them for what they're going to be in three years. And, and it's tough. So it's, you know, I've got, multiple seniors that are division one kids that don't have necessarily the right offer right now. You know, I've got three committed, but I've got three, possibly four more that I think are bona fide division one football players. But because of the way recruiting is, they got to be patient and I have to talk to them because it is frustrating. They grew up with him. He's got the offers he's committing, but we used to play park ball and I was better than him and I was bigger than him. And I, but his ceilings higher right now or his tapes better, or he runs a faster 40. I mean, whatever it is. So there is such a mental mind game. You have to play with your kids that want to go to the next level. And um, it's tough and it's really hard to manage because I'm, I'm the coach who's going to promote every one of my kids. I will, if I have a sixth grader that can get an offer, I will go and get him, try to get him an offer. It's all, you know, my main reason to, that I'm in this is to give kids an opportunity to play at the next level. I think that's something that I do pretty well. I don't know if I'm a good coach or not, but I can help get my kids recruited. And that takes time and effort and it's tough. And it's phone calls at night because you got to think about it. They're practicing. They're got families. They are doing all this stuff. And so the only time really to get a hold of these guys is at night. You got to just blow them up until they answer. Um, and so, you know, I'm trying to spend time with my kids and my wife. So it's just, it's a lot. So but much, so, so how much, and, and to that point, for people who are watching on Instagram Live, Darren, yes, put it on my, if you have a question, put it on my YouTube, on my comments, because that's where I can answer it over there. So thanks, Darren. Um, th that's the question about recruiting, right? Because how many kids are playing sports to be recruited versus playing sports to experience the game? Like I look back at my senior year playing at LSU. I spent so much time trying to get to the next level that I lost a little bit of my experience. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, cause I had it and then I lost it. And, and then it was like, I just, I lost my mind in that a little bit. And so I see so many kids and parents who are so focused on their recruiting element that they're missing the coaching, the developmental part of it. And I get it. It's huge, but, what do you, I mean, what do you think there? Yeah, it's, you know, I, I didn't play baseball past um, sixth or seventh grade. So I wasn't obviously anywhere near y'all two, but I, I go back to thinking about how youth baseball is now. And this is just me observing. I don't have like, my, you know, my son's a year old. So, you know, but like I see these parents at travel ball tournaments every weekend Mm -hmm. You know, I give my principal a rough time because every time I call him, he's got two boys. Every time I call him, he's at a baseball field, practice or a game. And it's like a keeping up with the Joneses. It's like, well, he's playing fall ball, so we got to play fall ball. Oh, well, he's playing all-stars, so we got to play all-stars. 
And it's the worst. It, and then it's like it's awful. Okay, but, but it's awful. But, so but, much setting that standard. But yeah. then social media comes out with a piece that says coaches love multi-sport athletes. Oh, they they do. How? Run track. Because, but how can they do it? Because the football demands, and Moody may not be like this, but there are other schools in this area, and I know across the country, that football is an 11-month and 28-day experience. 100%. And, and you're running plays, and you're doing seven-on-seven. Seven. Yeah. yeah, we'd love you to go play baseball. We'd love you to play basketball. We'd love you to run track. But which is your priority? Yeah. And it's a really tough message for kids and parents because when I first moved to town 20 years ago, I remember – you know, I was laughing because Spain Park had a um, Casey Dunn, who's now the coach at UAB. He was the head coach at uh, at Spain Park High School for baseball, and their indoor baseball practice facility was broken into. And I was like, we didn't even have one at LSU. We had to go down to the batting cages downtown after hours and get work in. And and I, I hear people saying that, but then at the same time, like I watched a Hoover Spain Park game or Hoover Vestavia. And there's a hundred kids on each sidelines. Are we missing some good baseball players in that because they have to give it up in order to play high school football? Or is that guard position that they probably don't have a, like no offense to you? You had no chance to play guard in college football. I did not. No, no chance. No, okay. no, no offense taken. Yeah. And so, you know, so I wonder, are we missing those kids to let them develop into something by the win now mentality of high school sports? Yep. I mean, you're building a culture, but if you had a two-way player at Moody who was a star third baseman or star point guard, you'd probably find a way right now to get him to yep. play. Absolutely. So, you know, being a 5A school um, with, you know, limited numbers in, in, your, in your male population, we, we have to share athletes because if we don't, somebody's losing. And so I actually – I make it, it – it is mandatory that you do two sports – unless you can come to me with a valid reason for you having a job in the spring. Hmm. So the main one, the numbers we got up this past year when I took the job was wrestling and track. We had, you know, our wrestling numbers, Moody's been great, great wrestling program. We've got one of the best wrestlers in the history of the state and of the sports names, Corey Land. If you hadn't heard of him, you can Google him. He's been in the Olympics. Um, he's at Northern Iowa right now. And he is, I mean, he, I don't think he lost a match in like two, 347 matches in a row or something like wow. that. Won five state championships. So, anyways, Moody's had a strong – so, first thing I said is, hey, Biggs, you're either going to throw or you're going to wrestle. I told my skill, you're either going to run or you're going to wrestle. And, <laughs> and that was it because not everybody's skilled enough. We've got a great basketball and baseball program, so not everyone's skilled enough to go play those two sports. But you're going to do something. You're going to get away from me. Because you don't want to be around me because I am a coach 11 months and 28 days. But I want you to go and be a well-rounded person and athlete. And that's something that, like, I don't think 7As have the luxury of that. I think that you you do have to evaluate as a parent, as an athlete, the specialization of a, of a sport. And I think that's a really hard decision to make. I think that if I was at a Thompson where I was for five years – it's not that the coaches not necessarily won't let you play the other. It's just like, okay, if you go for three months and play this, we'll just know your backup's here working for three months. You know, and it, it and that conversation is not even being had. That's just the kid thinking, that's the parent thinking, and it's 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 all across the board in 7A, you know. Yeah. And I think being at a 5A school, you know, our basketball program right now, out of 12 varsity players, 11 play football. Oh. 11, and which is awesome. And baseball, you know, that's more like a of a sport where not every baseball player can play football, not every football player can play, play baseball. But we've got, you know, 20 in the – nine to 12 that do both, you know, we've got a huge number in that. And then obviously everybody wrestles or runs track or throws. Um, so so you, what would you tell parents in that? Because let's say they are at a seven, a school and, and, yep. and I, it, it's tough because you have kids who grew up playing a sport and they, they love football or they love baseball and they want to be able to do both. They feel like they're falling behind, but there's gotta be some value they're bringing versus 
I mean, like a guy who's out there playing baseball or playing AU basketball or something. I mean, yeah. I don't, like, it, I, man, I think it's like it's I had daughters. Be, I had daughters, so I didn't have to do this. It's got to be an individual, like per player basis, you know. So I'll just give you a good example. I coach a linebacker at Thompson named Jax Van Zant. He's at North Texas right now, um, playing football. He was a s- superstar baseball. He was a catcher, and he played both. And his freshman year, he actually started at Thompson. My, he started as a freshman for Thompson, and he tears his ACL first game, freshman year, fifth play. He comes back from knee surgery, and instead of playing baseball, the not the first offseason, but that next offseason going into his junior year, he made that decision like, hey, I'm just going to focus on getting my speed and my 40 down because I want to play college football. Well, it worked. He got ended up with 15 Division One offers, signing with North Texas, and you know I, I think back to Jacks like if he would have played baseball and not gone to therapy 800 times a week extra, um, he was in the indoor working speed stuff every day because he knew that was his dream and that was his goal. That was his dream was to play football, and, and he just and he just couldn't get it done with the time that the man baseball demanded from him. But man, he was a good baseball player, so. I look at that situation, I say, he made the right decision. And yeah, then I and that's that. a kid who could play both sports. What about kids who – I mean, I guess my one question is, what about the kids who can't play both sports? So you look at them and you're like – I mean, it would be like you at guard. I mean, let's be honest, you're not going to play in the SEC at guard. Okay? That's right. I see the kids at Alabama. You ain't going to play guard. No. <laughs> I mean, I feel small. I mean, yeah, I'm no, 65, 290, and I feel small. It's, yeah, SEC alignment are, are a different breed. So – and those types of kids, let's say, who's who's going to play like like you know a legacy program, like you know where they play all the way up and they play through the community. Let's say like a Vestavia or you know John Curtis, where I'm from in Louisiana or whatever, right? They play their way up, but it's like their cap is probably their cap's going to be high schools, right? But they could maybe stretch bashed. When you think you've seen those kids that with reps, they could probably stretch to a college baseball. Do you give them that chance or do you just be like, hey, you got to make the choice? I, I think you have to try to give them that chance. And I think okay. that's that conversation that it's uncomfortable um, at times to sit a kid down and say, hey, look, man, I don't really see you going to the next level or playing, you know, like, hey, is it Division One or bust? You know, a lot of kids are like that. Oh, I just want to play D1. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, people don't realize that a Division Two school gets – 40 scholarships to split for 120 kids. So yeah, you got offered, but you're still having to pay. You're still having to have good grades. Um, You know, I think you sit that kid down and you want him to have a well-rounded high school experience. And you just say, Hey man, like you could help our basketball team. You could help our baseball team. Hey man, you need to be in that relay team. Like you need to do more for the school and the community, because that's the thing that I've learned of being at Moody. We got so many, I've got multiple three sport guys. My hmm. running, my running back plays five sports. Really, um, that's five insane. <laughs> and he's committed to Arkansas State, and he's a machine. I mean, the kid, the kid, you know, he's going to play uh, area baseball games, huge game. We're squatting in the morning, six forty-five, getting after it. I try to pull him out, and he just like grunts at me, like, mm. like don't don't tell me not to squat. And he squats five hundred pounds game day and he goes out there and has you know two for four double you know whatever like it's just some kids just have it like that and uh but being at moody what it does is it ties all the programs together because you got kids that are playing together your friend groups are like all together so you got your baseball basketball only kids showing up yeah. for football games and then you got your football kids showing up for these games and then you got just it just pulls the student body in together and I think it is important that you know especially at smaller schools um but man that's tough when you're at that big school and you got to make that decision like hey is it for my future I think you got to get some honest feedback like I, I I'm I've got a pretty good eye on if I can tell if a kid's going to play division one football or not especially with my experience and now with my experience in getting kids recruited, you know, that's like I said, that's my main job. When would you, when if you have a kid like that is that good, when would you start specializing them? Sophomore year? I think so. So typically, 
your junior year is your money year is what I tell people. It's your money year for recruiting. Well, it's changed. It's now almost your sophomore year. Like, tell me an out, a kid that Alabama's offered going into, you know, like they're going to offer. So the class of 2026 is your rising sophomores. They are going to offer those kids. They've already offered a bunch, but they're going to offer those kids this next cycle, December, January, February, kind of. They're, they're two classes ahead. Georgia's two classes, three classes ahead. You know, I was talking to Coach Freeze at Auburn, and, you know, he's obviously – he recruits quarterbacks. Like, he's he's like, they're ahead. And it's – you got – hey, you can have a really good 2025 quarterback. It's too late. They already got their guy going into his junior year. What about, and like, so, late bloomers? Because I'm, I'm a little sensitive to the late bloomer kid. Hey. I played one year of varsity. Yeah, and I had one Division One offer out of high school. So, you know, it, it it's just – I guess with the transfer portal now, you could go wherever you get started and move. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that, right? It's like uh, – it's That's like got to make you sick, though, doesn't it? It does because it's, te- it's killing my kids. But it's like NFL head coaches. How many recycled NFL head coaches do we see? Like this guy gets a job and then, then he gets a job just because they were at this job. And it's the same way with the portal. So once you're in the club, you're good. Like you're you're gonna have a place to go. But getting in the club's never been harder. And I've got multiple multiple coaches have come in this office and looked me in the eye and said, "Hey, uh, what do you got?" And you know, we look at tape, all this. He goes, "Ah, safety. We're going with two portal kids." And you sit there and you said, "Okay." And uh, so they already know because if they're losing two seniors. They're going to go find, you know, if you're a mid-major, why would you not go and comb Alabama, Auburn, Georgia's roster for those second, third-string kids that aren't playing that are going to hop in? Yep. So, And man, flip-wise, if you're the big schools, why not go find a sophomore at a mid-major that's grown up and developed and you've got college tape against an SEC school? Yeah, he's proven. That's how I got to Georgia. I had a good game versus Arkansas in 2014. Hmm. And uh, – you know, again, got her. <laughs> it was a rough game. That's when, uh, you know, Coach Bimo was in like 18 personnel, is what it felt like with eight tight ends out there. And um, everybody's a tight end out there right now. I mean, they had a six <laughs> nine tackle. I, I kid you not, his name was Dan Skipper. I still remember his name. I don't know. You know, oh, yeah, no, that dude was one. huge. Yeah, was that huge. dude was huge. Guys, he, he didn't even fit on the TV. <laughs> so, Funny story about that game. Y'all remember the O-lineman that threw the touchdown? Y'all remember that in 2014? Oh, yeah. The big, the big Samoan? Yes. So he, it's a fake field goal. Samoan, the Samoan, the 6'5", 400 dude backs up. And we're all like, what the heck's going on? And the center, the snapper was eligible. So I come off the edge, freaking Samoan dots me up over my head, and the snapper catches a touchdown I'm like, I'm like, oh my God, this can't, like, this just couldn't get any worse. What's going on? Right first thing I'm, I'm asking is, why, why did Arkansas waste that play on UAB? I don't know. It was like, it, it was probably like a 40 point game at that point. I maybe just put it on tape. You know, <laughs> okay. but hey, let's, you know, I know you're an LSU fan. Yeah. You know that I'm one and over versus LSU. I, you know I understand. That? Yeah, I understand. <laughs> I didn't know that. Someone told me that the other day. I had no clue. Let's go. They said, hey, you know that 2013 they had to vacate their wins. And I started thinking, I said, oh, we went three and nine that year. I said, let's go. We got three and the old Les Miles days, right? I mean. Hey, but look, you know, that was the game Odell Beckham one-handed. The that was that game, wasn't it? He took it 109 yards versus us. And then Auburn did that in 2013 about four weeks later. As Miles Long said in his press conference, he saw the tape. Yep. Isn't that funny? Six. That, was, sorry, that was a close game, though, wasn't it, against LSU and UAB? No, it was Mississippi State. We always played one team tough, and it was well, Mississippi State. Les Miles always played everybody close, so that's why I was wondering. I mean, hell, no. man, had to come back Wait, with four touchdowns. We, said, we went in that game. We said, hey, they're not going to run the ball. We're going to put as many guys in the box as we can. Zach Mettenberg got a helmet sticker because he threw for like 800 yards. So, <laughs> you know, well, hey, they didn't run the ball. I'll tell you that, by God. We were – it was – that was Jeremy Hill, Odell Beckham, Jarvis. Yeah. I mean, it was all of them. Stupid, was who of uh, – Dude, it was I, guys. As an LSU alum, we look back at that team and go, 
Wow, really? And I think the defense was bad that year um, because they had this unbelievably loaded offense and probably still averaged 210 yards a game because Les Miles was a potato head. Um, <laughs> he's the only person that has blocked me on Twitter, and I've never said anything about him hmm. on Twitter. I don't know why. Anyway, I, I have no loss, blood loss from that now. The mad head, or I don't know. I don't know. Roll Tide. Um, so last question before we let you go, and I think – you know, mm-hmm. this is when when a kid's being recruited and you're developing culture and building that relationship with them. When a co- when a player comes to play with, for you or goes to play for a college, what do you want them to look for in the program? Are they going for the coach? Are they going for the school? What is it? Because high school is the same way, right? I mean, I hate to say it now, but you got to look at what you know. And, and being from Louisiana, we're very heavy private school there. And so kids are going to shop the private schools. I mean, there's no, there's no districts. I mean, you're going to where you're going to go. What do you tell kids to look for? You know, I think with the state of college coaches bouncing so much, you know, and, and then I get it from their perspective. Like if you're not getting ahead of this potential staff change, it could be your coordinator leaving. It could be your position coach leaving for better. And you're the GA, like it's constant chess. In college, I think you've got to go and commit to the school. You got to go and see yourself there as a student. Not, you know, don't you don't have to go and say, "Oh man, they don't have biomedical engineering." You know, it's just got to be. Can you see yourself being happy there as a student? And if you can do that, to me, that's the first. The second thing you I can look hear at, the fight song and feel it, you know, it's your place. That's right. And I think the second thing you look at is like atmosphere on Saturdays, and then does that college town or fan base value football? And then, obviously, the coaching staff is important. Like, I had a couple kids with Power 5 offers. Well, we had to have a tough talk that those coaches, I had to tell them, hey, man, they're on the hot seat. So, if you commit now, they're fired in November, no, December. And then that new staff says, no, we're not signing you. They don't owe you nothing. And then you could be left with your pants down with nothing when you've got this committable offer, this new staff, you're going to be their first signing class. You're going to be their guy. You're going to be tied with them. You know, so those are things that I have to sit down with my players and parents and say, look, I don't feel great about this situation at this school. I think this staff's on their way out. I think this staff just got there and is building something special. I know it's a bigger school or it's a better conference, but this is the best opportunity for you next year. And that's something that we have to look at. We sit down, we look at depth charts, we look at roster numbers, and we look, You know, we try to get as in-depth as possible before making that big life-changing decision. And I think, you know, we've done a pretty good job so far. I'd be remiss not to to bring us back to Moody High School. Um, You're building something there. You talked about the people that didn't quite buy in when when I came over and met with you. Um, They didn't quite buy in. They didn't know what it really meant. They They were doing the best they had with what they knew, right? Right. And you've changed the line for them. You, you've you taught them. What's your vision for Moody? What do you want the people who are watching this to buy into Moody to understand the vision that you're creating so that the buy-in of those young men on your team are all in on together with what you're trying to accomplish? Yeah. So, I mean, you, I come in and it's, um, you know, the first thing I start talking about is state championships. You know, and like you could just see the the look in the eyes of my seniors and some other people like, hey, let's focus on making the playoffs, you know, pump, you know, hold on now. Like we need to <laughs> we need to do this, this and this, you know, and and like to me, with my belief in the work that we do as coaches and players, like I knew that we were going to put ourselves in a position to win every football game we were in, but getting the kids to believe that was the hard part. And to me, like extra work is what separates, you know, everyone knows ordinary and extraordinary. The the word is extra. So like that's what separated me and what gave me a chance to be a team captain or to play in the SEC when I was a 205 pound outside linebacker safety at UAB. Like I, it's extra. And so getting my kids to buy into that and know, like, like we'll go as far as they want to go. Like, my coaching staff is the best, and I trust them and, like, putting them in positions to be successful. But, like, somewhere in this state, 
somebody's working always. And you have to tell yourself that I have to tell myself that as a coach. So, you know, I think we came in and changed some things, kind of flipped, flipped some things upside down. And I think you see the momentum in the community, you know, we're getting a brand new high school, $62 million high school. We got a $1.3 million turf field last year. We've renovated the entire field house, new locker room, 85,000, $72,000 weight room. So like, the community is investing and they're invested in us. And then what you've seen is every sports program in our school had the, historically we had the best year in the history of Moody high school, historically basketball, softball, like top down. And I think that football fuels a school year. I think that when you have a good football season, your academics are better, your disciplines down. And I'm sure there's studies to show that. And that to me, I take that personal because I get to I get to set the tone for the school year. I get to set the tone for how our English teachers get to get after in the classroom. I get to do that as a football coach and really for the community because like the pride in Alabama for high school football, everyone knows it's special. I mean, it's religion. And that's why like I'm here and I do do this. Like it, you know, you walk around Moody. And it's football season now. Like, you're going to see somebody. They're going to let you know, you know, that was a bad call versus Leeds or whatever it was. You know, they're going to they're gonna let you know how they feel. And it's so special because people in Moody especially, like there's so many people that l- grew up here and now live here. You know, there's a lot of communities like where I live in Chelsea. You know, I, I know some people that are from that area, but most people I know from Chelsea are transplants. They, they've moved in like me. And – um Moody is just different. It it feels like people want to come back. You know, they want to come back home. And even the transplants we do have, they've adopted the community or been adopted by the community like me. Um, I feel like I'm like I was born and raised here just from 18, 19 months that I've been here. And so I'm trying to build not just a football program, but a community that sets the standard. You know, there's a lot of schools and programs that are you know, copying certain things we do or sayings. And um, it's it's awesome. It's such a compliment and it's flattering because we're setting the standard and we're doing things that no one's done. And then people are playing catch up. And I want that to be, you know, all around. You know, we actually had a social media PD professional development this morning for our faculty where we talked about putting a positive video or encouraging post every week for every classroom teacher, because we want people to see the good things we're doing in the science lab, in the home at classroom. Like we want people to see it's not just football, it's band, it's cheer. It's that's the Holy Trinity Friday night, but we want to take it that much further as a community. And I think you've seen the buy-in. I mean, we passed a tax to increase our tax. So you look at a community to me, that tells you if you want to grow or if you're not. If the community passes a tax where they have to pay more money to Uncle Sam so that we can have better schools and better resources for our kids, that was a big decision of me taking the job. That tax passed right before I took the job in December last year. And that told me, you know, yeah, it's an older community, but what, they, they want change. They want growth. And I said, you know what, I can, I can win there. I can win be, not because the kids necessarily, but because the community. And when you have community support, in a 5A football school, you know, it, it's everything. And so I, I'm just super thankful. You know, it's so cool. It's so cool to hear you say this because we talked about this in your office a week and a half ago, but or last week. It's so cool to listen to this because if you're listening to this and you're a business leader, you're whatever, listen to the vision, but the vision that has accountabilities with it. It's not just so many coaches get a job. It's like, let me just coach ball. Let me just coach players. And they fail to see – the reach that they create. The greatest college football coach ever and Coach Nick Saban at Alabama, I did a study. Well, I did a, a lit review. Excuse me, not a study. I did a lit review when I was giving a talk to the American Psychological Association about the impact of college athletics. And the financial impact on Coach Saban in the city of Tuscaloosa is monumental. Mm-hmm. The amount of applications to University of Alabama, I think have doubled or tripled. And you consider that an application costs, what, $75 or $150 for every application? The ACT score has increased exponentially. The average GPA, the number of students have doubled. The build-out has increased. It's ridiculous. And you're doing that in a high school level. But you could obviously repeat that at a college level because it's the it's your vision 
with action steps that have accountabilities associated with it. People always talk the big game, but they don't know how to lay down the big game. Yeah. And then you're also doing that by empowering the kids underneath. And somebody left a comment on YouTube. I thought it was great. It popped up. But is you got people to believe in the vision of what you're trying to do and to believe in themselves. And you've got an entire community believing in you. That's why I wanted to have you on because I knew that you have this charisma about you um, that, that's got a vision associated with it. It's more than just being a, you know, a, a great player. But, you know, sitting down with you for three or four minutes that day, I mean, I sat with you longer than that, but immediately I knew it was like, this guy, there's no bullshit here. This is real stuff. Yeah, it's it's personal. You know, I I, I just – I don't know. I, I wanted to be a head coach as soon as I got done playing. Like, I was like, yeah, I don't – I just want to skip all the steps. I just wanted to go, and I just wanted to, you know, have my have my program and then be able to implement – you know, influence the community and, and others because – so when I got to Thompson, I just said – I just kept telling myself, I'm the head coach in my room. I'm the head coach in my position. And I did things the way I thought. And so when I took this job, I said, you know, I, I'll be okay. I'll just do what I do with the linebackers. I'll just do it with more kids. And so what's been really cool is getting grown men and coaches with me on this, on this train, you know, on, on this journey. I, you know, there was four or five coaches that are still with me from the previous um, staff. And I've brought in a bunch. Um, we've got, 14 full-time coach, 15, including me. And so getting like – seeing that was probably cooler than seeing the kids because it's easy to influence a younger – you know, the freshmen and sophomores, man, they bought in like that. That's all they knew. Seniors was the hardest. But what about the coach that's been under four head coaches at Moody High School? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, this joker's full of, you know, crap. Like, he don't know what he's talking about. He been gone in a year anyways. Right? Yeah, like he's, you know – and again, it's that <clears throat> Georgia model we talked about. I I had to be vocal being the head coach, but like I tried to try to do with action. The first thing I did, first thing I did, I met with the senior. I said, "What do y'all want? Let's switch it up." They said, "Coach, new uniforms." I said, "Oh, you know, it was January Under Armour. It takes forever to get those in." So I called the guy. He said, "Look, I can do these if we order them by here." I do a light bulb fundraiser. I kid you not, we sell light bulbs. And I say, look, <laughs> y'all sell these light bulbs. I will buy you a new set of like alternate jerseys. We sold them. I bought them. So like there was me telling them something and then doing it. And then I said, okay, I'm going to get y'all a new weight room. I'm going to go fundraise. We're going to go get you a new weight room. We go and fundraise. We go get the money and we go buy a new weight room. They get to see that. They, I talk about it. And then I follow through. So, like, I'm big on no empty promises. You know, that's what college coaches, when they're recruiting you, they give you empty promises. Like, you come here, I'll do this. You come here, you can play here. But really, they're just trying to get a, a check, you know, check a box on, oh, we signed this kid and he's from Alabama. Or No empty promises. If you're going to tell a kid that you're going to do something, you got to go do it. And you got to do it by any means necessary. And I feel like my job half the time is being a fundraiser. Like, but that's what it takes. And it takes what it takes. Yeah. And uh, coaches that you do have, man, it's faith, family, football. You got to put, you got to have priorities and you got to put them in order. But sometimes it takes what it takes. It takes you staying up at night, calling, texting that kid that you just yelled at, checking on them not just going to bed because you're tired or watching film. Like if we're going to ask the kids to do it, we got to do it. And yeah. so that to me, like I, like I started with just seeing the buying from the coaches, like grown men, I'm the third youngest on the staff out of 15. And like, you know, I don't view them like they work for me. We work together and everything's collaborative. And like you said, like I want to empower them that's so one of the first things I told him. I said, be the head coach of your position. Yeah. Like that was the best advice that I ever either someone told me or, you know, I'm not saying I thought of it, but be the head coach of your position and like take pride in it. Like my linebackers at Thompson were the first ones to show up every day. If we had workouts at 730, Jack's man's dance rolling in at 630. Like just stupid. Like why are you getting there an hour early? Because that was our culture. That's what we did. 
So like I've tried to bleed that over and now I've got 98 kids currently on the varsity roster, which when I took over it was 51. So we're up mm. to 98. And now I see that every day from the whole team. I mean, I don't feel like there's a kid on my roster that shouldn't be on it. I think everyone has going to have a role, whether it's waving a towel or giving a look or being the guy on Friday night. And so getting that buy-in from the coaches was the first step. Then it goes to the players, and now it's in the community. And I think the excitement that's building around Moody football is just going to continue to grow. Like I'm, I'm planning on – you know, making making my mark at Moody and, and making this and building something extremely special, something that people are going to talk about for a long time. Well, you can tell the energy's there. Uh, I thank you for your time on a Monday night. I know you're getting yes, ready sir. to start. Was today first day of practice? First day. Uh-huh. First day. It was I good. Know, I you got some juice in you. I think yeah. you like all the time, though. We had a good day. We got a We got a long way to go, but it was good. Good. Well, all the best to you. Thank you so much. When we come back, Uh, I'm going to answer a couple questions that came in about the mental game and golf and stuff like that. Jake, thank you so much. Go Moody High School, and I'll see you out on Friday night. Appreciate it, y'all. All right, Bash, I don't know about you, but I'm ready to go play high school football at 50, almost 51. Dude, I'm ready to run out of the tunnel right now. Let's go. Let's go do it. Um, I just had a couple questions that popped up. I saw that came up in the comments. There was one from Darren. Can you pull that one up real quick and see what that one was? I can't. Yeah, yeah. So, Doc, what's the – yeah, it's from Darren on uh, YouTube. Doc, what's the mental process to deal with unforeseen changes that happen during your competitive round? Uh, for example, getting forced to take a cart when you prefer to walk and playing faster. Da, da, da. So I saw a great tweet this week talking about tra- um, having kind of a to- uh, tragic optimism mentality, right? I think so many times we go into competitions expecting everything to go our way. And then when it doesn't, we get upset. We panic. We, we, we add too much control. Our tension rises. Everything gets fired up and we, we play poorly because we don't know what to expect. You have to expect the bad things to happen. And when they do, run through a checklist in your mind. Number one, be aware of what's happening without judgment. That's fine, okay? I talk about this in my upcoming anxiety book, and it's critical. I call it the five A's. You got to be aware of what's happening. Number two is you got to anchor yourself in the present moment. So a lot of times, anxiety, stress, uncontrollables get you out in the future. They get you out freaking out. So pull back to the anchoring in the moment. It can be a process. It can be a mental cue. It can be a physical, you know, touch, something that brings you back in the moment. Number three, we're going to take clear, deliberate, and purposeful action on what we do. We're going to go back and figure out what we can do with what the scenario is. Maybe it's a bad break. Maybe it's a bad call. Maybe it's a bad ruling. Maybe it's a bad break. Maybe you hit a bad shot. I can still take clear, definitive, and distinct action on the next play, next shot. Number four, we're going to allow ourselves to adjust and be flexible in the moment. Okay, we don't have to be rigid and stubborn. And last, we'll analyze the drama later. If you can remember that those five A's, you can be successful. I talk about it in my upcoming book on anxiety. So, kick anxiety's ass, right, Bash? Got to. Pretty good book, isn't it? It's good, man. It's good. Ready to bring it to the masses. Me too. We're ready. When do we think? What What are we thinking? Sometime here in the next month or two. Yeah, that's fair. If we can get the moron who's trying to get, get it. <laughs> you got a lot on your plate right now, so I'm not complaining. Jeez. So Yeah, trying to get a, the, the moron that's behind the publishing of it, trying to get that right. guy straight. There's out. a reason why. People have asked me forever why I don't ha- why I publish, why we self-publish our own books. Um, I've had numerous people ask, um, you know, submit it to here, submit it to there, and I know that there's bigger right reach and all the other stuff. I mean, I like to publish our own because I like to have control over it and I like to do it on my own schedule. Uh, to be honest with you. I mean, yes, 
if Wiley or somebody came to me and said, hey, we'd like to publish your stuff, I'd be great. I'd be honored. But I have never once submitted a book, a manuscript to an agent, to a publisher or anything like that. I want to produce and write. And if people like it, they do. If they don't, that's cool. Should be um, our own agent. We should. Exactly. I had a question that came out on Instagram. I know we don't answer them over here, but I thought it was a good one. Why do yips and putting and um, – in putting or chips or, you know, feel so much more prominent than in a full swing shot. The reason is, and if you go back to episode three, 16 episodes ago on the yips on middle game live, you'll see that the, the smaller, easier things are more susceptible to the yips because they're more sudden surge of overwhelming anxiety. Full swings have a high aggression. Usually the yips in a full swing comes from a, uh, the ability to pull it back. But most throws that are yips are short throws. And uh, most yips that happen in golf are the shorter, easier things that should be made. When you're taking a full aggressive swing, you can take that energy that comes from the anxiety and direct it towards something aggressive. So that's why. Anything else? No, man. I'm, good. Uh, I'm on my way to Phoenix, uh, to, Phoenix to, to Memphis tomorrow for the FedEx. Hope my Two vastly goes. different cities. I don't know. I think they're both as hot right now. So hope everybody's staying cool, um, staying, staying dry. Hope everybody has a good one. We'll see you guys uh, next week, right? Monday. Monday night. Monday night. Yeah, hold on. Let me get my uh, yes, graphic your aspect. Aspect. Yeah, I spent so there much we time go. off. <laughs> Monday, August 14th. Same time, same place. Yes, we'll be doing it. We'll be getting after it. I'm three weeks away from my birthday. Look at that. There so. it is. All right, all you guys have a good one signing off for tonight. Make sure you follow us on social media. Make sure you hit a like. Tell your friends about Mental Game Live. Find a place out there right now where you can have live question and answer on your mental game for you, your players, your teams, all that. We do it right here, and we bring the best guests to you. It's not just some recycled group of guests. We bring guests that you'll never hear anywhere else. We bring them to you live.